All right. Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome back in. I got a very special guest with me here today, a football legend, you might say, from the University <laughs> of Auburn who played, uh, I think he was a first-round draft pick in 1984, if I remember correctly. Uh, I think he played a little Canadian football and uh, I think well, maybe with the Raiders and finished his career out and with the Denver Broncos and probably was arguably on the best Auburn team in history. Uh, probably got robbed of a national championship. Businessman and mayoral candidate Chris Woods. Chris, how are you? And thank you for coming on. Did I get up all that correct? <laughs> well, I tell you, you're close enough uh, from that standpoint. I'm doing great, and it's so honored to be a part of your show today. And thank you so much for having me. Oh, it's my pleasure. Well, um, uh, tell me, uh, uh, Chris, uh, what, what made you decide to wake up one morning and want to be mayor of Birmingham? Well, that's not the way it works, you know. Uh, uh, my family, uh, being here from Birmingham, and my father, Bishop Calvin Woods, and my mother, Miss Lucia Woods, uh, two of God's best friends, and with uh, six brothers and six sisters, uh, that's right, plus me, that makes 13. <laughs> so wow. it, it was a fun family, and uh, just raised uh, in a god fearing Christian home, uh, six of my five brothers, uh, uh, followed my father in full-time ministry vocation and my other brother who didn't said if someone would offer him a a pastor job he'd take it and my sisters are uh, uh, in ministry or married to ministry so we just been a spirit-led family and you know my father and my uncle was on the front line of the civil rights movement uh bishop calvin woods abraham woods uh, dr fred shuttlesworth was the core group leadership group here in Birmingham back then that brought people together, black and white people together. So I was born in 1962. Uh, tell you how old I am. So I came up in that era where, you know, man, God's purpose and God's focus for your life was imperative for, for just a normal life, you know, so that kind of stayed with me. So it was always a a calling on your life to be the best you can be to bless your community to be the best it could be and it's more of a calling for its ministry so we've always been a servant minded you know mindset is what we've always had even in sports you know uh, 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 in high school and college when we got to Auburn uh, we had what we call fellowship of Christian athletes and I was very, very involved in that. And uh, my peers at Auburn thought enough of me to uh, elect me as the president of the uh, Auburn University Fellowship of Christian Athletes chapter. So we've always uh, been able to serve and be in a leadership role. And leadership is about serving. It's about serving. And that's kind of how we get off track. Sometimes we may look at a person and they can dress up a platform they can fake a attitude, but you look at this, the, their life service, just what have they served, who have they helped, or what have they been involved in to really make a difference. And it's hard to fabricate a lot of this stuff like that, but that's kind of the way we've come up. And, and that's, that's, that's what that gives us true fulfillment because we know that's what God is pleased with when we do that. So I've always come up through that now and even now, after being blessed to go through a, a professional football career and return here and been in business now 33 years, going on 34, and even find myself in that type of service relationship throughout the business career, um, I'm a member of the Gideon International, and is one of the, it is the oldest Christian business fellowship organization in the United States. And what we do is distribute Bibles throughout the world and uh, organization founded in 1899. And, you know, I've been blessed in the local camp to serve at different levels of office and find myself now the president of Jefferson uh, County Eastern Gideon Camp, you know, right here in Birmingham. So we're just about serving. Leadership is about serving. I don't think it's, <laughs> if you're going to do it right, hey, you're the guy responsible 
Uh, you roll it up your sleeves to get it done. It makes sure it's done. It falls on you. I didn't uh, know that uh, he was your father. Uh, I should have put that together. So, uh, you know, so uh, to you, then this is about serving the people and helping the people. Would that be a fair statement? And that's that's I've done that my whole life. So it's nothing new uh, because we've done it our whole lives. It be in ministry, the community. And we was just raised that way that, you know, we, you, you make the sacrifice to make a difference. So nothing new to me is 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 want to pick up where, you know, people left off and what they desire to see our city be. Being a, um, a, a man of God, uh, uh, do you feel that if you could get more church involvement, that we could do something about the crime in Birmingham and and, and, and I'm bringing more, like I said, fellowship back to where people got along. Well, you know, I kind of like the way I was raised. Uh, we didn't weigh our badge because uh, it's just unfortunately what happened in our nation's capital up there. And people thought it was okay to go up there and storm the capital in the name of Christianity. And I just disagree with that. And I know there's a lot of mixed feelings about that, but it's, it's about serving people and uh, don't not being concerned with who gets the credit for it. So it's the mindset and attitude because that's, I don't know what brings people fulfillment. I know what brings me fulfillment and that's, that's making a difference in serving and bringing people together. And regardless of whether y'all, we've all stumbled and fall and made mistakes. But my biggest thing is what I've been so proud of how my parents and uh, raised us says it's not talking to talk but walking to walk uh, even my grandmother say Christy boy I'd rather see a sermon than hear a sermon <laughs> and it, it was all about behavior and conduct which speaks for itself uh, people should know uh, by your life people is, who know you uh, should know you and that's the, the real testimony for me not so much tooting my horn, but but how I treat my fellow man and what we so, do to make a difference. You consider yourself more of a man of action than Absolutely. just a man. Absolutely, and that's kind of how it's been. Uh, the business, all business, uh, uh, it's, it's not what you say, it's what you do. It's about performance. <laughs> and you can't <laughs> take performance. Uh, you know, we build on a building, you come back next month, you want to see some footings, you come back the next month, you want to see some vertical structure, you come back the next month, you want to see a, a structure top on it. <laughs> so it's the progressive, you know, plan of action is, is, is what we take and you can only do that with teamwork. What, what, what does a Chris Woods vision have for Birmingham? How do you, what, how do you see the city moving ahead? You know, without vision, people do perish and what we do, we have a vision. And what happens, what I see now is more of an agenda. An agenda is, is sometimes hidden and unknown, and it's just the benefit of just a, a, a privileged fruit people. But for his vision, it's about bringing everyone together. A vision can't be achieved unless everyone come together and be a part of it. The circle of prosperity must expand. It's just not for a faithful few. And what I see here in Birmingham and our beloved city, which we love so much, it's the number one thing is to bring people together. My vision is to bring people together. This is a nonpartisan race, irregardless of your political party association. Our country needs unification. And let's call on Birmingham to be the example. Uh, we were back in the civil rights movement. Birmingham became the conscience of the nation. And what happened, that unification brought us together. And I just tell you, one of the saddest moments in my father's life was when the stage riot downtown uh, over the statue and all that stuff last a couple of year ago, I would say, it just allowed people to go through our, our city as if they was peaceful protesting, but demoralizing it. And, and it was so sad to see him look at that and say, how dare they try to uh, fabricate or portray something that we really laid our lives <laughs> down for and people came together. So we don't need any of that. Uh, 
the dividers. We need to come together and we need to come together to support whether it's the political party, the business uh, community, uh, the education community, the faith-based community. I'm big with the 99 neighborhoods. That's why I'm going to govern. Uh, ground zero is the 99 neighborhoods. I will not ask my staff for about something of what's going on in a certain neighborhood, I pick up the phone and call that neighborhood officer and ask them, hey, what's going on in your neighborhood? Hey, what can we do to help you? Blah, blah, blah. So bringing everyone together to support public education, to create honest, transparent government, which we don't have, uh, to address this troubling, tragic path and crime that we have been on. We've been on a, a tragic journey uh, with this, this crime and homicides is out of control. And uh, fourthly, to you know, uh, create a work environment where people from all walks of life can get ahead. And I'm so determined and believe that if we all come together, we can come together as a community and identify other community-wide challenges and achieve uncommon results. And the citizens of Birmingham need to know under the Woods administration, their voice will be heard. There's so many people say, listen, we go unnoticed, we go unrespected, we don't get service, and neighborhood services would be a number one priority. Part of my 100-day plan of action includes uh, removing this blight from our community. I mean, we have dilapidated structures throughout the community that's just been allowed to sit. I mean, why would you allow a property to sit and dilapidate? Under the Woods administration, we would make it very, very clear with the law that if you abandon property in the city of Birmingham, we will confiscate it and sell it. And I just want it off the city books because it's so vital in revitalizing our neighborhoods and community. And I just want Birmingham to be the place where education is why people are coming, no longer the reason they're living, leaving, and want Birmingham to be that all-American city that she once was, where people from all walks of life can live, learn, and earn, and make our city what we know God wanted to be. I like the idea uh, how you sound, how you want to be a uniter and a, um, a man of the people. Um, one question I have for you, um, when you mentioned the crime rate, um, you know, uh, I think I've seen, but anyway, you know, crime usually goes with poverty. You know, people don't have money. You know, they're going to steal and oh, yeah. steal and leave, steal. And, and I've read, I think, somewhere our cities, almost 40 percent of the people are below the yes, poverty sir. rate. Uh, what, what, what kind of plan do you have to help people find the jobs or, or you know, get ahead? Of You're right. And, and Chris, that is that's dear to my heart. And I, I it might you notice my answers are uh, uh, God inspired because I have a personal uh, uh, relation with the with my plan uh, verbatim, and that is tragic. Uh, Forty percent, uh, and Alabama is 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 three five two zero three. It's the richest. It's the richest zip code in the state of Alabama. Chris right. is also the poorest zip code in the state of Alabama. <laughs> where People living in poverty where people live in affluent lives in the same zip code. And we have to change that. You know, lack of education is the number one thing. And I graduated from Auburn University with a degree in industrial arts. I'm a certified licensed state educator to teach any form of building trades. My darling bride, Cassandra, of 37 years, uh, graduated from Auburn in industrial engineer. However, we were exposed early. I was exposed at, and introduced to industrial arts at Carey Togo Elementary School. So I was put on a career path early. I got to Parker High School and they had the same major curriculum on a higher scale. So we left high school workforce ready. And now, unfortunately, those programs are no longer at the elementary middle school level is my vision to put those back so we can get our young men on a career path because if they don't have a career path, incidentally, Chris, when they removed those programs from the schools, uh, dropout went down, poverty went up. So 
they left. It wasn't, and most of them was interested in, in school because let's face it, Chris, not everyone is going to college. Everybody's sure. not going to college. So what yes. we have to do is prepare those uh, who are not by putting them on a career path and giving them a trade. And under the Woods administration, we will look to work with the superintendent and the school board to fund you know, that trade academy back. We have to put our young men and women on a career path early. Now, at the same time, how do we address the people who have gone through that? And we're going to have a person that's appointed, that's working for the mayor's office, that sole job would be uh, just co to assist the community uh, in job training and, and job placement and business training and business placements to get them a job. We can work with the union, the uh, Alabama Builders Contracts Associations, which I've been involved with, uh, the Construction Education Foundation is three to four places that we can send people right now, irregardless of their condition, if they really want to work to get trained and get on a career path is what we'll do. And also the current administration uh, previously uh, defunded 100% social services. So I want to have the social services where we have mental, mental uh, health uh, uh, officers in place, you know, to uh, uh, be there to, to, to help the police in dealing with some of these cases because sending the police to see certain things and do certain things, I think someone with some mental, a uh, mental professional uh, would do a better job teaming. So we cannot not have that arm of it a part of it. We have to have that mental health aspect of it and the social services. So what do we do when we get them off the street? Where do we take them? And there's so many uh, organizations we can partner with, the Jimmy Hale Mission and so many other places. There's over 20 uh, organizations that the city can partner with, you know, to uh, service people because People needs are going to be different. People's circumstances are going to be different. So to address the big picture, you know, uh, that's the immediate help we'll have to do. And the long term is getting our young men, you know, on a career path. So uh, let me just make sure um, the current administration, they defunded the social service program. Yeah, because I mean, the previous budget, they 100 percent defunded it. They because people would now since this campaign season, the election is next month within less than about 27 days. So, yes, we're putting the money back, but the real uh, deal was to defund that. Not only defunded that, but defunded education. And they was paying for 15 illiterate officers who was taking these young men and women who was behind reading, sitting down, bringing them up to par, and they defunded the program. So it just sends a clear message of someone who is just totally out of touch. Uh, you made a great point right there when you said that, because, uh, you know, sometimes you don't really want police officers being a first responder, somebody who has mental problems, because, you know, things can escalate. Yes, they are sir. not trained to deal with that. Somebody's oh, yes, going to end up getting hurt. Uh, oh, yes, and you made a great point, too, that I was watching. I didn't realize this. To, about the trade schools. I mean, I watched the other day about Build Alabama, and they're needing all kind of people, electricians, you know, great plumbers. Program. You great know. program. Great. And see, we want to bring that on the elementary school level. That's what we want. We want it on the elementary because our community needs it. Our community workforce is, is in our, should re we have to get these young men uh, on a career path. Uh, thank God for our. Hispanic brothers and sisters who really done a great job in the uh, workforce, but you know our inner city uh, black young men and women need to take their rightful place and get the training to be in the workforce. They need it. exactly because it's you know these young men in their city are still going to work. You know, and there's don't get me wrong. I mean, somebody's working at McDonald's. I admire them for working, but. It'd be a whole lot better if they had a trade as a plumber making $30 an hour and could provide a living for their family as opposed to having to work two jobs and, you know, McDonald's and not even making that. Um, uh, that's that I, I admire you. That, that'd be a great idea that would really help the city if you could get these young men learning to be an electrician or a plumber. Or, Absolutely. Or, Absolutely. And the thing about it is this is 
the apprentice protege program is where they are highly motivated to make you successful. They would do everything, train you. And I know on one flyer, I'm giving all to the young men. They can go right over here on Fourth Avenue South to the Union Hall. And my God, they train them. And it's in writing where they start out making $22 an hour. So it's, it's no excuse. Uh, the challenge is uh, how we have gone for so long. And the leadership has just, this has not been a priority uh, to our leaders. And I think this is a direct relationship with crime because the greatest crime tool is a quality education to prevent the crime from happening. And these young people, uh, uh, we, we have failed them. I believe if you give me your child for 12 years, I'm supposed to give you some back. And I just tell you one of my legacy that I will live and do everything in my power to accomplish like I said, to make Birmingham city schools the reason why people are moving to Birmingham and no longer the reason why someone would be leaving the city. Yeah, I, you know, I hate to keep hammering this way again, but I mean, but if, uh, but that is so great right there. I mean, if we had these young inner, inner city men, like, like you said, we'll go in this, you know, so that some people are not meant for college. They're not. Um, I mean, I know plenty of people, you know, but if we can get them like you said, going in there and starting off at twenty-two dollars an hour, and there's there's no reason they're not having incentives to, or there's no reason to go. The crime rate's going to drop <laughs> if you if you're making twenty-two dollars an hour and you can go out and buy the things you want to buy, you're not going to have to. Uh, 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 right now, know, that's a fall start. That. That's a start. That's starting out. That's starting out. You have your full career ahead of you. I have a classmate. My God, he saw me on the campaign trail. His name is Kirk. Kirk and I went from the first through the 12th grade and Kirk is retired and he's trying to sell two of his businesses. <laughs> he went straight to the workforce and got his trades and mastered them. And I was at a car show in Ansley a couple of months ago and it was these antique cars and one of my high school buddies was in contingent to win first place and our other high school classmate rebuilt the engine. <laughs> Oh, God. We learned all that in, in, in high school, but we were on the career path early. It, it was it was intentional. It was an intentional effort to make sure you were placed in something. And and I it you, a, sorry, I mean, a young man, well, well, he's my age, but a guy I went to school with, uh, you know, he wasn't the um, uh, academia guy, uh, but he went and learned uh, I just keep seeing that down on Facebook. He learned to trade in welding. Well, he just retired from a uh, community, uh, you know, did 20 something years of community college in Mississippi. <laughs> he's oh, got right. a pension, state pension as a welder. Oh, and he's doing his own business now. And he's came back to Alabama and he's teaching in uh, a welding school. So he's teaching in welding school in Alabama, got a pension out of Mississippi and on his own business, you know, probably That's making awesome. $150,000, $200,000 a year. And, you know, and, uh, uh, that that's what we've got to do. I mean, right there. I mean, awesome. You know, they're awesome. And see, our young people will respond if you catch them early. And, you know, the other big challenge with deterring this is, unfortunately, uh, Chris, in Alabama, they determine the future prison population by the third grade reading rate, meaning if you at the third grade and you're reading below your grade, uh, that's why the big thing in the legislature with the governor, they was begging that the governor would, would uh, not allow these third graders to advance to the fourth grade if they was reading below the level. Uh, let's fix this now. Uh, however, uh, my plan for that is to have a free preschool program where we start youngsters off at three year old going to school, learning to read then and give them a state of the art uh, early childhood education program that's one of the great one of the greatest in the United States uh, at Auburn University. Uh, I was proud to go through that program and expose that to our three year olds, and that's going to put them on a solid uh, boost. Alabama is first place in a lot of things. They are first place when it comes to preschool education, uh, thanks to uh, Governor Robert Bentley and Governor Kay Ivey. Uh, let's give credit what credit is due. 
to fund the four and five year old pre, pre, preschool programs. So that allows our youngsters to get up and what the city is gonna do is piggyback on that by getting our three year olds because I think that's the age where man, they are so ready to go. And this is no type of pressure, yeah, learning, but exciting learning uh, is what it's gonna be. Like I say, I, I'm an educator myself and I personally experienced the program and seeing youngsters just, just, just advance and loving learning uh, and just put them on a good educational boost. So we feel that'll be the big long-term program because uh, these prisons that they justify building, they have to have a future uh, population number to justify building a new one. So this unfortunately uh, is something we will uh, challenge and make a difference in that as well by implementing <laughs> free preschool programs. I want to ask you uh, kind of a tough question. I don't think it's tough, I mean, to me, but uh, do you think that, it's, that there's come a time that we should, that we have to, this, I'll make this a two-part uh, question. One one thing is do some type of decriminalization of marijuana and because we're just putting people in the system and just they get locked in there. And then the, the second, part, second part is, is that we have to do something to change our Dra Dra Dracanian drug laws. I mean, because we're sending people to prison for, you know, something that we should be rehabilitating them for, and they just become locked in the system and just they end up in, being in prison the rest of their life when something if we rehabilitated them and um, instead of sending them to prison, that they could have a better life for themselves. Did I ask that question right, or does that make sense? Well, you know, early on when I came through, uh, we had something like character education. And uh, it had a lot of stuff, things mixed in it from mental education uh, and so forth. So something needs to come back to kind of help us uh, in that area uh, from that aspect of it. Uh, people make mistakes. Uh, I think we need to send them to rehab. Just don't right. let them in there and leave. Let's, 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 let's go in there. I know this never happened to you, but I heard of you get a ticket, your first ticket, speeding ticket, you can go to driver school and and go through all those programs to be a better driver. And I think something similar, you know, to help, you know, to get us off that. Now, individuals who just gonna abuse that, you know, that's something different. Right. They have to be dealt with differently. But, you know, individuals who made a mistake and wanna get on a uh, uh, rectify that, they should be granted that opportunity and at the same time, you know, something to make them uh, come out of it better. Yeah, it's, I've, I've just seen so many young people that, like you, said, you know, make a mistake and, you know, because something's a certain amount, you know, they go to prison automatically for three years when, you know, like, hey, why don't you just send this guy to rehab for six months and give him a chance? If they make the second mistake, then, you know, okay, right. they had the chance. But, you know, I just don't think for something like that that people should be ruining their lives. And, uh, you know, I'd like to see something – you know, like that done. Um, so we've covered education. Uh, what, what about health care? I mean, uh, what, what do, you, do you have any plans for that or something? Well, you know, uh, I tell you, we live right in the mecca of, of health care around here. I mean, you we do. University of Alabama and the Health South, the Baptist. Oh, God, you're in the middle of it. And my God, uh, we got so many great leaders that's doing a great job. I met people. That is one of the reasons why a lot of people move here. But, you know, we want to make it a, a accessible to people from all walks of life. I know the county deals with that a lot. Um, and the city, you know, like I say, hadn't been so involved with it. But through the social programs, we're going to have to be a part of that community and making sure our youngsters, you know, I know we used to, when I came up, they used to make sure we had physicals. And you know, someone would just donate that. I mean, I mean that was that was just something very special. So it was a lot of good things going on uh, from that aspect of it. My biggest thing is I want to see uh, a mental health. You know, on the elementary school level, uh, youngsters are, are, are challenged with with some serious identity crisis and peer pressure and and bullying and so forth like that. So I think 
we need to reach those individuals who think it's fun to do that type of stuff early and incorporate that into our curriculums because uh, it's really needed. Even sensitivity training, uh, conflict resolution. I mean, everybody want to fight. <laughs> <You know>? <laughs> <laughs> hey, I grew up, I just love my childhood. I mean, if you wanted to fight somebody, you told your brother. Your brother went told that guy, brother. You tried to talk to each other, and they didn't. So then they said, well, we don't, we want this come to an end. And he said, you bring Chris down here and we'll be there. So they just go over there. So y'all can't get along. Y'all just fight. And they let us fight till we got tired. And with that old thing, you put a pencil on his shoulder, pencil on my shoulder. <laughs> he knocked my pencil off. I knocked his pencil off. He hit me. I hit him. And, and you know, it was all never escalated to we want to kill each other. We just blew off the steam. And guess what? That was it. He and I became friends because we didn't want to have to fight for an hour. <laughs> he got tired. And they said, you got enough. You got enough. I mean, it was done that way. But today, you know, it's not it, it, It's not like that. It's, it's, it's no, no, no sense of the word of resolving it. You know, it just escalates and escalates. So uh, we need to have some in that. But my greatest priority is the crime. Uh, Birmingham, as you know, uh, last year set a, a 25-year record high for the most yeah. homicides. And I'm fortunate, Chris, we are ahead of schedule right now. And as of today, Chris, Birmingham is the number one most deadly city per capital. I've seen that. Birmingham. And Chris, that is that is tragic. We have to reverse that. We have to come off the FBI top list like that. That cannot be. And my plan of action is a, a seven-point crime plan that I have. And the first, number one pill of that is to partner with the Jefferson County Sheriff's Department. Birmingham is over 200 policemen short. Uh, people can't wow. tell you they, they beat officers. And I understand on some beats, there are no officers. It is what it is. However, we must come together. It's about this unity. Let's unite and come together with the Sheriff's Department, make up for that manpower. Uh, it's budgeted to have those 200 officers. Let's free that money up uh, for some other issues. We're going to do crime deterrence against gun violence, gangs, human trafficking, and drugs. Uh, we have to we have to do that deterrence police, and once we get that cleaned up, then these partnering with the sheriff, this manpower we'll have, and now to have beat officers in place that keep it because in the history it was good easy to go in with a task force to clean it up. The fact is, what happened when the task force left? You have to have those regular beat officers in place, and we don't have the manpower to effectively do that. So equipping the police department with the tools to do the best job they can do. And then thirdly, is crime stoppers. We have to have crime stoppers. And I'm gonna ask the citizens of Birmingham to trust the Woods administration as mayor to go back to the neighborhood block captain watch. Uh, what happened with that, uh, a matter of trust uh, caused the relationship to go south. People just didn't have trust in the police. Uh, people knew who was calling, and that should never be. That's the transparency we have to make sure we have as mayor. And our education, I mean, it's number four. It's that free preschool, getting our young people off right. And also in the middle school and the high school workforce ready, where our young men will leave high school with a minimum of two certifications, whether being welding, electrician, we're going to put them well on their way on a career path. So that's number four. And see, we're freeing up this money instead of going out hiring 250 policemen, which we're not. We're going to partner with the sheriff to free up that money for social engagement, number five, community engagement, where the social service program will fund those programs. And listen, we will have a a, a vision and a plan and agenda to go to Montgomery, to lobby uh, grant funds, to go to Washington, to lobby uh, grant funds for these social programs. They are out there. We're not going to get them. We could have went to the state 
and got a uh, funding for a, a mental health facility uh, that the state put up for grant for just three areas. And I believe Birmingham, the most, uh, I met powerful city in Alabama can have an impact when we come together though, and uh, work together like that to really make that happen. And then number five is uh, remove the blight from the community. Uh, we read neighborhood revitalization is at the top of my list, not at the bottom of the list. <laughs> And uh, we'll revitalize it, the potholes, uh, uh, the trash, I met the lighting and so forth. On hey, Chris, there's places in this city when it rained, still, when I was a little boy, it still floods. And we need to address yeah. that issue. I encourage the mayor to take all that money that we got through the CARES Act to relieve it and address the storm drainage, the infrastructure issues here in the city. Then lastly, uh, we will have a liaison that will work directly in the mayor's office, you know, to address all of the uh, job training, uh, opportunities, needs, and so on, and job placement to be that connector, the bridge uh, with the community, the business community, training, further education, and so forth and so on. I think these seven pillars is going to really make a difference, but the the biggest one we'll see immediately impact in is partnering with the Jefferson County Sheriff's Department. Uh, Nashville has done this and they've just proven to reduce the crime rate tremendously because you have a cohesive strategy. Everybody now is working together. No one is pulling apart. Birmingham is the largest city in Jefferson County. And the sheriff, if you could take the numbers out of his numbers is Birmingham, he'd be the safest county in America. So we have, we want to work together and we had a motivation and the uh, transparency uh, to make that happen. So, I mean, you sound like you're ready to go fight for the city. And uh, I mean, this is a tremendous plan. I've never, I've never heard any other mayor or candidate talk about this. I've got um, one other question for you, um, or actually two. Um, and I know you're a busy man. Um, oh, no. Talking about revitalization, I, and I was talking to a friend about this the other day. You know, I see the thing is revitalizing. To me, Norwood, I mean, there's mansions there. I mean, that looks to me like instead of East Lake or something, that would be the, the place to revitalize these, these. These, I mean, there's mansions there. I got a friend that bought a house on one of these streets, and you know, you're right off the interstate there. I mean, have you given any thought about that area as far as? Um, oh yes, it's a city, whole citywide effort, and a part of my uh, revitalization, Chris. Uh, I got so much. I mean, I really got so much, man. <laughs> I mean, because it's God's size dream. We're going to take is over 21,000 land bank plus uh, properties in the city possessions, over 21,000. We're going to take those, Chris, and I want them off the books, whether they be in Norwood, uh, Eastlake. I want the, the, the stakeholders in that community and people of this city and others to come in and take those properties for $1. We want them off the city books. Why should the city be holding these properties? And guess what? They are allowed to dilapidate. Now, what I'm going to share with you is so true. And I am I was embarrassed for this lady, but she was so happy that I was there to see it. Beautiful home in Norwood. This wonderful lady has lived her life and retired and uh, just love her community. You can tell her yard is beautiful. And right next to her house is the most dilapidated, run-down piece of property I have ever seen. And it attracts mice and everything like that. And she asked me, did you just see that mice run across my porch? And it's sad that, that she has to live like that. And so many other citizens in Birmingham have to live like that because our lack of poor leadership uh, is, is out of touch. I mean, you let a house sit there. What if that was your house? You know, it's like nothing registered. So that's all over the crib, all over the city from West End. It's 99 neighborhoods. I've been to every neighborhood. And though that's not in all of them. I don't see them on the south side too much and out in some other areas. But most of our inner city areas have a humongous uh, 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 quantity of dilapidated properties that are have to be addressed and moved up. Hey, and guess what, Chris? We repopulate those communities 
which they are being repopulated. Listen, I've been over in a mansion where it's been totally revived. I <laughs> bet something that was 100000 is going to be valued over half a million dollars. I mean, so I had a friend who... I'm um... so excited about it. And with the growth and opportunities we have for this city, I mean, that's what you want to do. But you, the, the people who live there feel threatened by people trying to run them out and the room of gentrification. I'm explaining people know this is your property. You fix it up. Uh, wouldn't you rather have a good neighbor than a bad neighbor? <laughs> you know? I had a friend that did that. You talk about we feel like for a dollar or whatever you say. So yeah, he went in there and bought one of those houses. Forgot to pay the taxes on it, and oh, when yeah. they're spent thirty thousand dollars on it, I mean, he's got this mansion there, and oh, I was yeah. like, man, if they come oh, in yeah. here, I mean, this city would be, I mean, it would be beautiful again. I mean, because some of those houses, you know, can be fixed, but some of those houses, you can turn that into a great, beautiful neighborhood again. Well, we will do that, and what we're going to have to do is keep the grass cut and stuff around it, simply because, and we'll have to uh, uh, note that lien if that owner's not willing to pay for it. And like I say, it's confiscated. The law is clear here. If you abandon, the key word is abandon the property. Now, if you're living in the house, that's that's good. But if you abandon that property, uh, you know, we want to make it clear the law on the books allow the city to confiscate. Because we have to send a message that you cannot do this in Birmingham. You have to send a message that if you a criminal, you will not be welcome in Birmingham. We have to send this message of, of responsibility and accountability. And if you do something, you're going to pay for it. We're not just going to let things go unaddressed and send the wrong message to the next generation that you can get away with it. But the important thing, uh, Chris, we have to put our young people on a, on, a, on a generational wealth path. And this real estate uh, with these uh, properties uh, really, really make a difference in what we plan to do with the school yeah. structures, work with the school board to to re repurpose those structures for uh, educational training, finance management, like I say, uh, mental illness, uh, anger management, resolution conflict, <laughs> crafts, uh, eating right, uh, physical fitness, uh, it's so much, it's just so much, and as boards I've been able to serve on in the past, you know, that I look forward to, you know, expanding those uh, opportunities to other people as well. Chris, you have got a great plan. I mean, I've never heard a mayor candidate that has this laid out. I mean, detailed. I don't know how long you've been working on this, but I've <laughs> never heard any other candidate. What is one thing right now, one pitch you could tell the voters? I mean, if you're talking right now, give them the vote for you. I mean. Well, it's what we've been talking about, um, uh, uniting people, you know, bringing people together. Uh, teamwork makes the dream work. Uh, I talk about my family, uh, the calling uh, perspective and what my parents, how they raised us in the face of the civil rights and having their lives threatened and saying, hey, the love of God transcends all understanding and bringing people together, you know, to know that I'm going to be a god fear man who seeks God's guidance first. And, and I'm going to always be about uniting people together. I'm never going to uh, tell you that this city is in a deficit. I'm going to be transparent with you. I'm never going to tell you the city is in a deficit uh, when it's not in a deficit. And we've seen uh, just unacceptable behavior by our leadership to go that far to, to justify firing 500 people in the middle of a pandemic. Birmingham, the largest city in the state, yet we were the only city to lay off employees simply because the current administration has a hidden agenda to get rid of the employees so they can privatize certain city scopes of work. And that's not, that's not right. I won't stage all that. I'm gonna be forthcoming with you. I won't stage a riot. I won't allow people to come to this city and just, just tear it up like that and not be out there on the front line myself. But it's, it's just so much I'm different. You know, I'm a man of my word, a man of the people, for the people, by the people, and man, just want to make a difference. 
And I'd like to do this though, if you let me do this, please. My website is chriswoodsformayor.com, uh, chriswoodsformayor.com, where all of these, uh, my platform is in detail. My vision is broken down and I invite you to go see it uh, because I just have God-sized dreams. Uh, I want to do things to grow the economy, to grow our revenues, a hundred million dollars. And we see the neighborhood revitalization could easily get us to about 40 million and some major projects uh, to address the food deserts throughout our community uh, is going to involve the public part, pro, public private partnerships uh, to make that happen. But one, and, and, and the infrastructure itself, you know, uh, going down the path of alternative energy, uh, solar, solar energy is what I'll be planning for revitalization in the community, as well as uh, being a giga city, you know, to increase the connectivity with the world games coming. We're going to have more yeah. people in Birmingham than we've ever had, and we need to increase the connectivity uh, capability now. I mean, we need to get, a, it's time for Birmingham to be proactive and stop uh, responding. And we're going to do that by having a vision and not hitting agendas uh, from that standpoint. But I want to see Legion Field become the multi-purpose uh, state-of-the-art facility that, that she should be. I, awesome. I it down. Hey, uh, we had the SEC here. Uh, we had the SWAC championship here. We lost both of them. Uh, because people want this indoor multi-purpose facility. And we have the biggest economic uh, impact event, which is the Magic City Classic. And boy, mm -hmm. can't lose that. So what we want to do, my vision is to make Legion Field a multi-purpose facility uh, with a dome. That's a great a idea. Purpose entertainment uh, facility. Unlike anything else in the country is what we have had an opportunity to take from everybody else to make Birmingham uh, facility that great. And look what we're going to do. We're going to have year round events. Uh, that's a beautiful stadium UAB has. And believe me, uh, I can't wait to see the games. It's beautiful out there, but it's going to play about five games a year. And that's what they wanted. I mean, that's what they got. But we're interested in year round events. You know, where, you know, regardless of weather <laughs> or, or conditions, you know, uh, the show will go on. And during the off seasons of, uh, of uh, football, you know, the facility still is useful. Right. We're going to make it multi-purpose facilities. So we're excited about that. And the community is really responding to our, uh, our, our attitude about crime. We've had a press conference. Uh, we started our campaign uh, January 13th. And as you know, uh, last time we ran, we got 18% of the votes. Mm -hmm. and what we've done is recaptured that support and we've doubled uh, that support. So Chris Woods is on his path to victory. Please don't believe these false polls uh, what shows, shows that I am less than two point four percent well i seen that i was shocked i was like wait a second i said he got yeah. almost 20 percent of the vote less i said yeah. i don't buy that yeah how how can you explain a man who got 18 percent of the vote who's double what he has and my lord and says only two percent but you know what that's no big deal the big deal that's just an effort to suppress the voters to suppress people who would uh, contribute to my campaign. One, Dr. King said a lot of good things, and we like to quote him a lot. And one of them is said, uh, "Keep your eyes on the prize and don't get distracted by the lies." And that poll is a lie uh, because that does not represent where we are, and the people are the one responding. I can only uh, go by what the people are committing and telling us they're going to do. So we're really excited about it. And uh, at the end of the day, the city is going to be better, and we plan to finish the race strong. Well, thank you very much for coming on today. I'll make sure that chriswoodsformayor.com gets put at the front so people will be able to see that. Um, and good luck on this race, and thank you very much. And if they need me to call me, uh, my cell number is 205 uh, nine six five 
888-789-7124. I mean, I want to answer your question. Give me the opportunity to earn your support. That is the man of the people right there. I'll make sure hey, I put that man, up there. I, hey, my father taught me he was the pastor. He said, the members want to talk to you. You can't have a private line if somebody <laughs> needs to be proud. So I've just, I've just seen it happen, and you have to be accessible because that's the only way you make a difference. Hey, thank you, Chris. Thank, thank you, so you very much. much, Chris. All right. Thank you. All right.